everyone. Welcome again to the online course on online teaching. We're here for lesson three about shifting the fabulous from the fake. So about teaching with the use of sources. And together with us, there's uh, Ute Arkeman Boeres. She is a European ambassador and she is a teacher at the American International School of Cyprus. So Ute, uh, you have the floor. Thank you for being with us today. Thanks for having me. Um, and I think today we are talking about um, let me just share the screen so that we can actually start with the shared screen. Let's share. All right, so the topic today is sifting the fabulous from the fake. And uh, we are talking about the use of evidence in your online teaching. And that's mostly based on materials and strategies that, which were developed by the Stanford University Education Group. Um, under the title or heading, Reading Like a Historian, that's uh, the name of the module. But before I go a little, uh, I go into that in more detail, I would like just to, um, to, to point out why it is generally a good idea and good practice to use primary sources in history education. Well, it, we couldn't say it, it generally helps students to develop critical thinking skills. Um, it allows students to use and read different perspectives and then in turn this helps them to analyze um, texts and then to weigh arguments against each other and eventually this is the, the approach of multi-perspectivity. It also allows students to analyze texts, images, objects and so on in order to acquire an understanding of the period they study. And finally, and uh, that is a very important uh, aspect, I think, is it helps students to understand how historians work and also how historical narratives are created. So using primary sources um, alongside, let's say, a main textbook is really good practice and it's good practice for inquiry-based teaching as well. Okay, so there are a number of websites uh, which offer freely accessible source collections. And I just um, copied a few in here. The one that we are focusing on is the Stanford uh, History Education Group website today, but there are many, many other resources. And these are the resources that I usually use uh, in my teaching because I'm teaching in an international um, school an American international school. I use also a lot of websites from the United States, uh, from um, foundations there, from um, museums and so on. And I have to say, they are in most cases excellent. And uh, they provide huge source, uh, source collections and also templates that you can use in order to analyze sources. Um, so we have, for example, um, the Smithsonian, which, um, has a history explorer. We have the National Archives. These are the American National Archives, but you can also have um, the National Archives uh, from the United Kingdom. And they have, um, for example, document analysis worksheets, which I'm going to look at later a little bit more closely. Then of course, Europeana, which is amazing. It has a huge source collection. Um, stretching over various uh, time periods, different topics. And again, um, it is freely available and accessible. And then finally, the Stanford History Education Group, which we have here on that side, which um, is also very, very helpful in uh, using sources and it gives um, worksheets, it gives a number of tools that we can use to um, use sources in online teaching. And these are some of the tools I want to point out. And the most interesting thing is that um, we have, of course, um, tools that are also um, scaffolded. They help students uh, of various levels and of different levels to work along. And um, this one here from the National Archives is a really good example. We have two forms of uh, a similar task and um, a graphic organizer. This is uh, both looking at written documents. How do we analyze written documents? And these written documents, uh, these um, graphic organizers are for different levels. So here we can see the more basic level for students who maybe learn English at this point. 
And here we have uh, another sheet, another graphic organizer that helps students uh, who have already a higher level. Then we have, this one is from the National Archives as well. We have a primary source analysis tool, and this works online and students can click on the question mark, it gives them prompts, and as you can see, there are a variety of prompts that help students develop sources. And we always have different stages. Here we have, uh, what can you observe? Then you start reflecting upon the source, and then you start asking questions about the source. So this is really good practice in how we can, um, how we approach um, primary sources. And all these are available online. Yeah? So this is, um, for online teaching, the most important aspect at this point. Another very uh, useful and amazing tool or guide is from the Smithsonian. It's called Engaging Students with Primary Sources, and it's a really good guide of how students can approach different types of primary sources, diaries, newspaper articles, images, and so on. And I would say from a teacher point of view, these are amazing tools, and they really help teachers um, tackle the task of how to teach students analyze primary sources. Now, a teacher can use, of course, also other tools. Um, first of all, we have these websites that I showed you before with the source collections. Yeah, so this is really helpful. Other digital tools a teacher can use is the, the one notebook. And I will just minimize that and um, show you an example of the notebook that you could use. So this is um, a OneDrive notebook where the topic is at this point, if you can see it's the 1920s, and we have a research task about women. And you can upload a number of sources. And you can, uh, this is one example, you can then upload it as a PDF document or as a printout. Let me just uh, show you some other examples. Um, where we're going to talk later on about how to create a portfolio. So teachers can use these online sources, uh, these digital tools in their classroom in order to create uh, very good tasks. Let me just enlarge that again. Just a moment. All right. So teachers can also themselves create PowerPoint presentations and they can do voiceover of the PowerPoint presentations and for example, upload them on these notebooks. So students can listen to the presentations again, uh, if they didn't get it the first time. So these are tools that are really helpful. There's uh, Microsoft Teams, which helps uh, students to communicate. You can use um, interactive whiteboard there. And students can also share documents on the OneDrive. So we have a variety of digital tools that can help uh, students and teachers to make online teaching easy. Now, what I'd like to show you is one example from the Stanford website, um, just to show how, um, how uh, uh, primary source analysis can be approached. And we have here, this is uh, the module on the Black Death in Florence. And as you can see, you have here the online document. It's available. You can upload it. Then you have uh, closed questions. But the most important thing, and this is really um, these questions that we have on this side, is the source believable? What is the difference between fiction and nonfiction? Um, is uh, a fictional book actually a good history source? What does it make it less believable? Uh, so we have a number of sources and this on the left side is an example of the source collections that the Stanford website offers. Another online tool that you can use with OneNote, with a notebook, which you can, where you can upload actually both um, images is how to analyze uh, photographs or other images. 
And this is taken from one of my lessons here, where we were talking about uh, what actually does this photograph tell us. This is Eleanor Roosevelt, and she's talking with a five-year-old girl in Detroit, in Michigan, in the 1930s, at the period of the New Deal. And you can have a layered um, inference worksheet where you can approach um, Im um, images and photographic sources, and you would start off with what can you see? And I started off with the students. I used a, a pen where you can highlight um, at the same time as you're working online, what we are doing just now. You can highlight certain aspects of the photographs and ask the students, what do you think about that? So, um, for example, I pointed out that Eleanor Roosevelt and the girl are at the same level. What does that imply? So, first of all, what do you see? And then you would write down, what can you infer from this? And then um, another question would be, or the, the, outer, the outer layer would uh, layer would be, are there any questions that you could ask about this photograph? And this you can do with a variety of photographic sources, or you can do that also with uh, political cartoons. And uh, by using, for example, uh, a pen, um, you can also highlight certain aspects like I did here, where the first lady is holding the hand of the little girl. Again, if we go to the other side, what can you see? And what can you infer from that? And what question may you want to ask about that? Or you may want to look at her facial expression um, and at the girl's facial expression. So what can you infer from that? So these are very, um, very helpful tools uh, that help students um, develop an understanding of how primary sources can be interpreted. And um, I think this can be done at all levels that can, um, of elementary, middle, or even high school. More tools. Um, I had a cartoon. Again, we are here with the, in, the new, in the New Deal, um, where Roosevelt is uh, represented as the captain at the helm. And there's another form, this is from uh, the National Archives again, that tells you very clearly how you can um, analyze sources. Again, these forms are all available online and you can also upload them on the OneDrive and students can then um, analyze the sources. So we have a very detailed and a very scaffolded approach of how we can uh, analyze cartoons. And again, with a pen, I, I circled in a few important points here. And um, again, you can either, uh, students can either print it out. These are all editable, editable um, uh, PDF documents and students can then uh, write onto them and upload them again or send them to the teacher or save them on their, on their computer. So there are various ways of how you can save them uh, and store them. This is another example um, of how you can set up an activity which uses online source collections. And this is about um, the period uh, of the robber barons or captains of industry, so late 19th century, early 20th century American history again. And as you can see, um, it is always a good idea to, of course, outline what is your lesson aim, what you want to do and make very clear that your instructions are really detailed and that you show students how you can um, access the various sources. Here in this case, I made links to the various documents that are online available. But I, what I did here before we go there, they first had to investigate uh, one of the big industrialists. And uh, we had then a class plenary where each uh, student um, introduced his or her industrialist and then decided, does that make him a robber baron or a captain of industry? And then the third um, important thing is that they had to write an assessment and they had to use different perspectives based on the various sources they found. And as a, a, um, another activity was then the responding um, or how did the workers respond uh, to the industrialists. And here we have, as I said, the links to a number of sources. And I just show you what one looks like. It's 
one of those. Again, they are online available. You just click and the students can read them. And you would then go to, um, you can use, for example, um, graphic organizer where you write down what is the origin of the source, uh, who wrote it, what was the purpose of the source, and what were the main points, what were the messages. And then the last question would be, does that make the source reliable? What is the perspective of the source? And you would help students develop uh, these uh, critical thinking skills and analytical skills by using a number of graphic organizers. Here's the source. And um, again, this is from one of the source collections that I showed you before. Now, on a OneNote notebook, um, it could look like this, where you have, um, where students um, had an inquiry question. Did all American benef Americans benefit from the boom? To what extent did they benefit from the boom? And the students would have a variety of options. What they would have to do is they have to use primary sources, but the end product, so to say, could be very different. So the first choice would be, um, a, let's say, a traditional paper portfolio where they can enter evidence taken from the sources to support Hoover's claim that everybody was doing very well. Then the second part would be evidence which challenges Hoover's claim. And then would be the bibliography, which sources did you use, um, but also what is your overall of um, judgment of the situation. That would be the first choice, a paper portfolio, if you want. Another choice could be that students could make a PowerPoint presentation with voiceover or a video essay, but it shouldn't last more than three minutes. But I have to say, in this case, the students took a little bit longer because they had found so much material and they wanted to show it. So they were not penalized for that. It was their first attempt. Um, of course, what is always important is that you have the, um, the grading rubric uh, with the different levels and with your um, criteria so that students know exactly what they have to do. And um, what I'd like to do now is I'd like to show you an example of a student work, a few minutes, only a few seconds, not a few minutes. And this was an example of a collaborative video essay. So where two students work together. And this is something that um, students can also do um, in online teaching um, or in an online situation that we have now where they are at home and where you want students to collaborate and um, where you want to avoid that they get more and more isolated. You could ask them to do a collaborative video essay or PowerPoint presentation. So I will just minimize this and then open the video here. So this is just an example of how uh, two students created their video essay. Again, this is on the Great Depression and the New Deal. Attempt to take advantage of the great efforts that are put out in order to help out people like you. Look here, buddy. In this cartoon, you can clearly see the struggles that we farmers must go through. Every object depicted in the cartoon has a literal meaning behind it. For example, the ladder, which has farm prices written on it, is seen as going down. The next thing that can be seen is the farmer climbing towards the roof of the house. But when he's up there, what can be seen is that he needs help. We farmers got to the top during the war, but all of a sudden, we became less important. So now, we are in need of help, just like the farmer in the cartoon. Every word on the cartoon describes our needs. We ain't in the situation we want to be in. And according to Hoover saying that there should be no poverty, this is not the situation that he wants us to be in either. Therefore, we must make a change. Before we all decided to vote for President Hoover, he has made great promises for us as a country. Nevertheless, it was not in his hands to know that he's going to enter the presidential role during the time of the Great Depression. This is the advertisement about voting for President Herbert Hoover. In the advertisement, it seems that he had promised voters a chicken in every pot during the campaign of 1928. Hoover is promising all the citizens that voting for him will lead to every person having the ability to purchase food. This relates to what Henry IV said. I wanted, I wanted to be no present in my realm, so poor that I would not have a chicken in his pot every Sunday. Okay. 
uh, the students um, made that a little bit too fast because they wanted to save time. That's why they're talking so fast. But I think you can get an idea of, um, of what the students can achieve and how they can uh, collaboratively create a video essay. And um, what you can see here is the question uh, they were asking, the research question, the inquiry question, did all Americans benefit from the boom? And they were using um, evidence and different types of sources to support both sides. So uh, what you saw in the video was on the one hand, uh, who was playing there in 1928, where he said, everybody will benefit, will do fine. We have a chicken in every pot. And then we had the other student presenting the view of those who did not benefit. And in this case, it was the American farmers. And um, you might have also heard, even though they were uh, talking a little bit fast, how they interpreted the sources, how they made reference to the details of the cartoon or to the, the, the text sources, what the source was saying, and then eventually reaching a verdict of how reliable is that source, um, which perspective does that source show. So that's a really nice example of how students can um, use primary sources. Um, and apart from just producing an essay or a, a short written answer can become more creative. And this is very attractive, especially to students who may not write, want to write always an essay and it gives them, and those tax, tech savvy students, they have also an opportunity to do something, um, something different. And it makes the lesson also very interesting for them. Um, so, what evidence-based activities can students do when they are learning from home? And these are, again, just a few examples. Um, they can read the sources and then use the graphic organizers that I showed you before to analyze the sources. This would be the first step. And this they can do on the notebook. Um, you, as a teacher, can provide the sources and they can just enter the answers and then you can also communicate with the students. If doing inquiry-based activities, the students could also collaborate. And I think especially at times where students are at home and isolated, these collaborative tasks are really good because they have to talk to each other, they have to communicate with, uh, with each other, and they are not just isolated in their room at home. For example, they can create their own source portfolio, which is then based on a guiding question. They could create that PowerPoint uh, presentation with a voiceover. And as you could see, they could create a video essay using primary sources. They could also do a vlog uh, or a blog where they use evidence from primary and secondary sources to bring across a certain point. So um, there are a variety of examples. You can have, there are many other interactive tools available, but of course, this always depends on how um, accessible, how good the internet is. Does every student have their own laptop? Uh, if students, for example, don't have their own computer or there's um, only limited use um, or availability and they have to work with their telephones, um, the activities, they can be adjusted. So we always have to see, of course, what, are, what is the context in which the students have to learn. And uh, this is not always um, the ideal context. So some of the activities need to be adjusted. Um, what does a teacher have to have in mind when he's planning a source-based activity? Because um, source-based source -based online activity, first of all, um, every activity should be inquiry-based with a key question, but that's a given. That is really how you should approach every source-based analysis and activity. It's also very important that the teacher really gives clear instructions. And this is, um, for example, here, where you can see that um, I very clearly point out what you have to do, how many sources do I want you to use, five sources or um, 10 sources, depending, okay? Um, and then you have to scaffold, you can scaffold the tasks, you can do it in various steps. Um, I think this is quite important so that the task doesn't um, appear overwhelming to the students. You can create links to the source connections, collections, but you, as a teacher, you have to make sure that uh, these links are still live, that they still work. So before you give out anything, uh, make sure that the links still work. 
And I think the graphic organizers, they can help the students a lot. Um, for example, like this one here. Yeah, so where you can help students um, approach the sources in a more organized way, in a more systematic way. And in the end, where the students can then base their evaluation of the sources on the in information they have found uh, or they noted down uh, in their graphic organizers. And these graphic organizers, again, they are great help for differentiation. Um, again, they are scaffolding, so it allows students to approach um, their task in a step-by-step -step manner. Okay, so this would be what I want to say now. Let me um, stop sharing. Okay, so that's what I had to say. Do you have any questions? Yes, uh, I do. I did note down a couple of questions. Uh, thank you for your very, very interesting presentation. Um, I was wondering, because of course, I mean, this was also the topic of the lesson, you showed us how to use the sources, but I was wondering, when do you use sources? Do you create lessons that are only based on source analysis or do you use the sources before the lesson starts so that students enter in the, I don't know, in the periods that you're going to look into or afterwards to check as a sort of assessment to see if students have followed the lesson or as a combination of all of them? Mm -hmm. I think I would use it as a combination of all of them. For example, uh, you can use a cartoon or a photograph as a lesson starter. Yeah, you can just, uh, or as a unit starter, you would uh, show um, um, a cartoon or an image and you could ask uh, students to brainstorm. What do you see? Um, and um, based on that, you can then work on and um, create a source-based uh, inquiry based questions or you would have to have your inquiry question um, but students also need to learn the context you need the context in order to analyze the sources so you have to have also maybe um, a small uh, section where you um, teach the context where students um, learn about what was going on at the time because you need the context in order to analyze the sources um, you need to you can integrate the sources then in the wider context with a variety of activities and um, at the end and I showed you some of the activities and at the end um, you can have an assessment the assessment can be as I said it could be an essay it could be um, a form of research essay it could be a form of shorter questions where you scaffold how you uh, would you how would you analyze uh, the source what is the message of this cartoon for example you can assess this also if you use the same criteria that you use in class so students actually know um, how to approach such a question and of course um, these products if i call them uh, of a video blog or of um, of a, a powerpoint presentation they can be graded and um, they will be assessed so you have to however uh, as every time you have to um, present your criteria at the beginning and then you move on. Okay, mm -hmm. thanks. And the other question that I had was, um, I really enjoyed the video of your students. Uh, I think they spoke very, very fast, but I, I can see myself in that because if you have a limited amount of time and you have many things to say, uh, you will speak very fast. Uh, but I was wondering, I imagine uh, you asked your students to find the sources themselves, right? Yes, yes. Did you, did you give them a list of um, source collections or source repositories that they could look into? Yes, so um, you can do both. So for the more adventurous students, you can um, maybe ask them first to, to go and scout by themselves. But really to make their work a little bit easier, you would uh, give them links to certain source collections. For example, the ones that I showed in the PowerPoint presentation, they are thematic source collections. Um, or I provide the sources on the notebook in a digital form again, so they would have it there. They can use those sources. So there's, there's maybe the option where you can say you, you could use a number of sources from the sources that I provide you, from the collections that I provide you, but then I'd like you to also venture out and find more sources of your own. And I have to say, um, some of the students, they came up with amazing sources and um, sources that 
um, that are not necessarily in those source collections. Um, so I would uh, generally, in, that was done, however, in a class situation, a classroom situation, but in an online situation, you would give them maybe a week to do their research. Research. So you have to also adjust your timing. Yeah. You have to tell them um, you can spend so and so many days and then show me what you have. And then we take it from there. And um, of course, the online situation is always a little bit different from a classroom situation because in the classroom, you would walk around and help your students. Online, um, you would have to communicate differently. You would have to use maybe Teams. Our students would have to make screenshots and send them to you via email and tell me or ask me, is that a good source? Can I use that source? So you would have to work differently. Yeah. Okay. And um, do you do you check for copyright of the sources, or do you ask your students to check for copyright of the sources when they are looking for them? Um, the, the copyright of the sources is if they are the source collections by the various institutions, if you want. So the copyright question there is clear. Um, and I think uh, you can use the sources in lesson if you don't publicize yeah. things, you can use the sources. So the copyright issue becomes then an issue if sources or if you want to publish something. But um, within the, the context of, of, of teaching and education, it's normally not a problem. Yeah. I was, uh, I mean, I know that the National Archives and the, um, uh, and I believe also the Smithsonian, they, they clearly state the copyright and Europeana does the same, but I was wondering since also students can look for their sources. I for yeah. sure when I was in high school didn't even know that sources could be copyrighted. So, you know, I, yeah. I that, that's unfortunately, I, I mean, debatably fortunately or unfortunately i think that we need to take into account now so i was wondering how to go with it last question i promise is uh, you mentioned that the graphic organizers that you give students can help you with differentiation mm -hmm. um i can you elaborate a little bit on that because i believe i understood but so okay, so um, if I uh, maybe I go back to my PowerPoint presentation mm -hmm. again because there's this really good example. Um, hang on. Um, if we go back to this example on, on this slide here, this is taken now from, um, from the National Archives. Mm -hmm. So this is um, how we analyze written documents. And the first, the, this one in the background is it uses a lot of images, it uses simpler words, but the point though is the same. So for example, you have meet the document and you, you check what kind of document is it? Is it a letter? Is it a speech? And you have here images, you can't see them because they're covered. You cannot see all of them. Is it a handwritten note? So this is more for, this is, it gives visual help in a way. Um, whereas here at the higher level, it would be just words. Um, but then you would also have um, questions like try to make sense of it. And you have a question, you have smaller question. What is the main idea of the document? Okay. And here you would say, what is it talking about? Write a sentence summarizing this document. And here it would be just list two quotes. So this is a much um, more close text reading in, the, in, in this paper here. Whereas here you have to make already your inferences and you have to paraphrase. Whereas here you take passages from the source that you think that fit the point, but here the next level would be paraphrasing and, and, um, and getting a more abstract um, judgment, let's say, okay? And then again, how can we use it as um, historical evidence? You could see that if that wasn't covered, that is a much, um, these are much simpler questions. Um, whereas here, they are already more challenging. So, and um, these prompts here, they also help very much for differentiation because um, what did you notice that, that you didn't that you didn't notice earlier? So it gives you these steps, and this is really helpful for uh, for differentiation for scaffolding. It helps students. So if they answer these questions, uh, they do it step by step in a more gradual way. Okay, thank you. And do you? 
do you send all the options to students and then students choose the level of difficulty that they want to follow? Yes, you can do that. You can um, actually have the different options and then they level the, they okay. can follow that level. Yes, what they can pick what they think is they can manage or if they want to challenge themselves. Yes. Okay, that, that sounds very interesting. I, I can imagine that some students would want to challenge themselves and some, especially now in this uh, challenging period, would prefer to take it a little bit more easy. So it's, uh, I yeah. quite like that there's a possibility for students themselves to, to decide yeah. the intensity of the lesson for the week. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, that were my questions. And thank you very, very much for your presentation. I think it was very informative. I learned very much. Um, so, I mean, for everyone who's watching, see you in a couple of weeks for the next lesson, which will be about engaging students. Uh, so we'll pick up from where we left with Ute together with Helen Nelson and discuss how to use online cooperation to engage our students and make it so that they can, for example, talk with their friends, even if they're far from each other. And Uta, thank you very, very much. Thank you.